All right, guys, we are back in the book of James. We finish the book of James in this lesson. So we'll be in James chapter 5, verses 13 through 20. If you want to go ahead and pause the video so that you can get your Bible and turn there, go ahead and do that. Um, I always encourage you to follow along with um, whoever is teaching or preaching on, on Sunday mornings, Sunday nights, whenever. Um, follow along with them in the Word um, <clears throat> by having your own Bible out um, and reading along with them. Um, that way that you can, you can try to see in the text itself where they are getting what they are saying. So you can follow along with what they are saying, with what the teacher is saying or the preacher is saying, and figure out how did they get what they're getting. Where is what they are saying in the text? Um, so I encourage you all to do that um, even now as we're on YouTube. James chapter 5, verses 13 through 20. I really see this passage um, as an explanation of what takes place within the Christian community. Christian community. I think that's what this passage is about. There's two main themes here that take place. Um, number one being prayer, um, and the other one being um, restoration, um, or you could maybe possibly say church discipline. Um, it's the idea of one, praying, and then two, running after a wayward brother to try to get him back. Um, so you have the idea of Jesus leaving the 99 sheep to go get the one. Um, that's, 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 part of, that's kind of theme two uh, that's expelled in this passage. So you have Christian community is the main theme in my opinion, and then you, underneath that is sub, sub-themes, is prayer and... Um, restoration or reconciliation or going to get the wayward brother. Um, and so I want to go ahead and read uh, this passage. Uh, and then I have a big long list of 32 things um, that I see in this passage um, about Christian community. What is Christian community comprised of? And I see 30. 32 different things in this passage, so I'll read those to you after, after I read this text. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sin to one another and pray for one another, that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not, that it might not rain, and for three years and six months it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. My brothers, if anyone among you wonders from the truth, and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. So here are the things that I see uh, in this passage that Christian community is comprised of. And i got a big, long list here. Christian community first is comprised of suffering. So James, James says in verse 13, he says, is anyone among you suffering? Um, and, and, and James knows that the, the case is that there are people suffering among these, this people group that he's writing to. You remember in chapter 1, back in verse 2 of chapter 1, he says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect. So he's saying, I know... There's trials among you, and those trials are a testing of your faith, and you need to let that testing of your faith produce steadfastness in you. So James knows um, that there's trials and sufferings 
going on in this community. The word suffering in verse 13 of chapter 5 is a very general word. It could refer to um, pretty much any kind of suffering. I think when I taught chapter 1 verse 2, when we, when we looked at the word trials, he, James even even gives the same kind of thought process here. He says, trials of various kinds. And I noted that that was kind of a junk drawer phrase. Um, anything that you can think of that tests your faith, that's that's a form of suffering. It's a form of, of trial. Um, and so you apply that to our world today. We think of the coronavirus. We think of the storm that just hit. Um, and some people that had damage. Um, there's, a, there's a person down our road that had some pretty serious damage. Um, that is a trial. Uh, I don't know if they're believers or not, but if, it, if, a, if a believer at our church had something like that happen, that is a, that's a form of trial, um, and a possible uh, form of suffering. Um, and the next thing that we see uh, James says that Christian community is comprised of is prayer. So you have suffering, and then you have prayer. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him what? Let him pray. And James doesn't really say what to pray for, um, although he does tell us uh, what to pray for a lot throughout this book. If you want to go back and look um, back to chapter 1, verses 5 through 8, James tells us, If anybody lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, but let him ask in faith with no doubting. So James has told us many times um, what to pray for in this book. Um, we ought to pray for steadfastness in the midst of our trials, that we, that, that we let steadfastness have its full effect. <clears throat> we ought to, we ought to uh, verse 12 of chapter 1, says, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast uh, under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life. So we ought to pray for steadfastness in the midst of trial. And there's, there's many other things uh, in this book that James tells us we ought to pray for in the midst of suffering, in the midst of trial. Um, so I encourage you to continue to read through the book of James and, and find those out. Um, but sometimes I think we get so caught up, at least in my own personal life, uh, I, I can be asking the question of what to pray before I even actually pray. And so I, I think the emphasis here is let him just pray. Some of us just need to pray. We don't need to be concerned about, uh, what should I pray for? How should I pray? That, that, that'll come a little bit later as, as you know, we'll, we'll help you with that. But we just need to pray. We just need to talk to our Heavenly Father like we talk to other people in our lives. It ought to be that regular. It ought to be that normalized in our lives. Let Him pray. So let us pray. Let us just simply pray. The next thing is cheer. Christian community is comprised of suffering, prayer, and cheer. Is anyone among you cheerful? So James knows that James is not a teacher of the prosperity gospel, right? That there is no suffering in the Christian life. He's already told us that is anyone suffering? He's assuming that there's suffering going on in this passage. He has a category in his theology that allows for Christians to suffer, and we ought to, too, as well, too by the way. So don't let anybody ever tell you different. But then he says, is anyone cheerful? So we're not just a community comprised of deeply downtrodden people all the time. There is joy in the Christian life. There is cheer in the Christian life. Um, and, and it's always it's not even connected to our circumstances all the time. These people that, that James is asking, is anybody cheerful? They could be going through a trial. They could be going through some suffering. But they just might have a different perspective on that suffering than other people do. So there could be a category of people that are suffering and they're not happy. They're, they're really struggling with that suffering. They're struggling with steadfastness that James calls us to. But then the other group of people, they could be experiencing the same exact suffering, but they have a better perspective on it. And they're cheerful because they know God's plan. And they are steadfast. So happiness in the Christian life is not always tied to our circumstances. In 2 Corinthians 6.10, I believe it is, Paul says, We are sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. I think that phrase comprises and explains the Christian, um, the Christian experience of joy and suffering simultaneously. They both can go together in the Christian life. 
suffering and cheer. They, they can be interwoven and connected in the Christian's life. So James says, is anybody, does anybody have a cheerful attitude? Is anybody just enjoying life as it is right now? Does anybody have a good perspective on the suffering that you might be going through? Um, and therefore you're happy and cheerful. Then let him next. Number four, sing praise. Praise is the next thing that comprises Christian community. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. So, were you kept safe and without damage in the storm last week? If so, that's a sign of God's protection and provision and care for you. So you ought to be cheerful, first of all, because of it, and then sing praise because you are cheerful. Turn on Spotify and, and go to Matt Boswell's His Mercy Is More album and sing His Mercy Is More. Sing in Christ alone. Sing the doxology. Sing songs of praise and truth to God because you have a cheerful heart. Life could just be going well for you right now, and that's okay. Sing praise. The next thing Christian community is comprised of is sickness. Sickness. Is anyone among you sick? Now, I have to admit, this is where the passage gets really tough. I had a really hard time with this passage. Um, there's a lot of different interpretations about it, um, and my interpretation of it actually changed several times um, until I finally landed on what I think James is trying to say here. Um, so James says, and anyone among you sick, and I'll just, I'll give you the next uh, four things that Christian community is comprised of. So we got sickness, that's number five. Number six is caring elders and pastors. Number seven is prayer again. You'll see prayer pop up a lot. Number eight is anointing. Number nine is Jesus. Uh, number ten is faith. Number eleven is salvation. Number twelve is resurrection. So that's probably more than four, but uh, going all the way down to number to number twelve: sickness, caring elders and pastors, prayer, anointing, Jesus, faith, salvation, and resurrection. Um, and the reason I'm giving you all those right now is because this is a tough text. Verses fourteen through fifteen, very very tough to interpret. Um, the trouble starts off with the word sick used in verse 14. It's used, a different form of the word is used in uh, 15 um, as well. Um, so let me just go ahead and read through 14 and 15 and then we'll carry on from there. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church um, and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick. And the Lord will raise him up and if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. So James says, is anyone among you sick? The word in verse 14, um, it just means weak. That's what the word sick, we, it's translated as sick in the English uh, translation of the Bible. But the word just means generally weak. It's used, there's a different word used, um, a different Greek word used in verse 15. It says, in the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick. It's translated the same in our English Bibles, but it's a different word in Greek. And it means to be worn out or to be exhausted. Uh, the word in verse 14 can refer to physical illness. It can refer to weakness, spiritual infirmities, uh, a tormented conscience. It's, it's a very general, broad term. And for that reason, there's been a lot of confusion about what James is talking about here. And you can really boil it down to two different things. One, this is what one school of thought says, that James is talking about a physically sick person here. Um, so somebody uh, that is in bed sick, a very serious form of sickness. Um, <clears throat> is anyone among you sick? Some people take that as physical illness. Let him call for the elders of the church. People that, people that have the physical illness side of this argument, they say that this person is bedridden, Therefore, he can't come to the corporate gathering, and that's why he's calling for the elders of the church to come to him. And it's also why they are praying over him. It's a picture of somebody laying in a bed, and the elders praying over him. So they're standing around the bed, and they're all gathered, praying over top of this person. Anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. We'll get to that in a little bit. That's a confusing phrase, too. Uh, but we won't have a big problem with it. Um, so there's the physical side of this is a bedridden person that's physically ill, right? 
Then there's also the other side of the argument that thinks, thinks this is talking about a spiritually ill person or a spiritually sick person or a spiritually weak person. So it's really the argument of physical infirmities, physical illness, or spiritual infirmities, spiritual illness. So the people that go with the spiritual side of the argument, and this is my view. I, I was the physical view when I first started studying this text, and I really think it's talking about spiritual illness now, or spiritual weakness. Um, verse 14, is anyone among you sick? That word means weak. Let him call for the elders of the church. What are the elders? They are the spiritually strong people in the church community, right? They are the men of God. They are the men of faith. They are the leaders of the church with special, um, with supposed to be special wisdom and discernment to lead God's church, to shepherd God's church, especially when there are struggling sheep. Right? So let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of what? Verse 15, the prayer of faith will save the one who is weak, or sick, translating in English. And the Lord will raise him up, and if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Now, the reason I think this is talking about a spiritual, um, spiritually weak person is the surrounding context. Um, and we do need to be careful here because James is not always, um, he, he, he can be all over the place. Um, so, while I think the surrounding context leads us to believe that this is a spiritually sick person in verse 14 through 15, it could very well be that James has just totally changed his train of thought and starts talking about a physically ill person in 14 and 15. But as far as I see it, it seems to be James seems to lead us to believe that it's a spiritually sick person. So the reason I believe that is chapter 5, verse 7. James is saying, Be patient, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth. Keep in mind that phrase. Being patient about it until it receives the early and late rains. So these people are facing uh, persecution. They're in trials in, in chapter 5, verses 1 through 6. Um, you have the, the end of at the in verse six. You have the phrase, "You have condemned and murdered the righteous person. He does not resist you." So they have rich people in this community that are oppressing the righteous people, um, that are fattening their hearts in the day of slaughter. They're living on the earth in li in luxury and self indulgence. Um, the they have kept back wages from laborers in their field. And James is saying all of this to lead up in verse seven to say, "Be patient." As a farmer waits for the fruit of the earth, being patient about it until he receives finally the fruit of his crops, right? You also, be patient, verse 8, establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord. And then he goes into do not grumble against one another, brothers. Verse 10, as an example of suffering, important word there, suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider them who remain steadfast. We could consider those blessed who remain steadfast. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. So James continually is bringing up this idea of patience, establishing our heart, um, uh, being steadfast. The word steadfast literally means to be under a really heavy load for a really long period of time. And James in chapter 1, verse 2, which I've already read several times in this passage, uh, chapter 1, verse 2, he says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith, so trials and sufferings are testings of our faith, you know that the testing of your faith produces what? Steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect. So James opens the book with saying, you are going through trials. Yes, it could be physical, it could be emotional, it could be, it's a junk drawer phrase. You're going through trials, and in that trial, your faith is being tested. A spiritual quality. You, your faith is being trampled on by a trial, and you are to have steadfastness to bear up under that trial with your faith. And guess what can happen? When there's a trial and a suffering continually bearing down on your faith and your faith and your faith, you can grow spiritually weak. 
That's why James in chapter 1, uh, verse 4, tells us to let steadfastness have its full effect. It's hard to bear up under a trial for a very long period of time. James in chapter 5, verse 11, brings up Job. We know of his sufferings. He was being destroyed by trials. He had physical, he had boils, but the main thrust of his trial was testing his faith and his, it was making him spiritually weak. Now, he didn't sin in all of it, and he was, you know, we have the great example of Job. But all of this surrounding context, all of this being bludgeoned in the head by trials that are attacking your faith, I think it leads us to believe that this weak person in verse 14 is a spiritually weak person. That seems to be the broader context of the book of James. Is anyone among you weak? James is probably assuming they are. And he's probably going back to the same thing that he began the book with. They need their faith strengthened. They need to be steadfast. That's what he led up to verse 14 and 15 with in chapter 5, verses 10 through 11. Let him call, if you're spiritually weak, call for the elders of the church, the spiritually strong, to encourage you and pray for you, pray over you. This phrase, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord, I, I think this refers to a special, special consecration of this person. This is a very serious, uh, spiritually weak person. This is not your everyday, uh, you know, you sin, you confess your sin, and now you need to call for the elders of the church so that you can be prayed for and lifted up. No, this is a very downtrodden, spiritually defeated and depressed person. Very, very serious. You might even argue, if you look at verses 19 through 20, that this person could be on the verge of wandering from the truth, because James brings that up in 19 and 20. He says, My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth, and somebody brings him back, so that's in James' thought process here too, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. So maybe this person's on the verge of death, spiritual death. Maybe they are entranced in a multitude of sins and they need to be specially consecrated to the Lord. That's what this anointing with oil means, I think. Um, it's symbolic in that you are setting somebody apart for a specific purpose of healing, of spiritual healing. Anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And then James says in verse 15, and here's another key is why I think it's spiritual. The prayer of faith will save the one who is weak, and the Lord will raise him up. What do, what do people need when trials are continually pounding down on them, especially when trials are defined as tests of faith? What do they need when their steadfastness and faith is being tested? They need mature men of God, the spiritually strong leaders, to come and pray for them the prayer of faith. They need faith. They need the prayer of faith to save them from what could happen if they, uh, if they give up under the weight of suffering and trials and if they give up in the midst of the spiritual weakness. The prayer of faith will save or heal the one who is sick. He will be spiritually healed. He will, the, the prayer of faith will heal the one who is weak. And the Lord will, guess what? Trials are coming down, coming down, beating on the head. Remember the word steadfast means to bear up under a trial for a long period of time. What will the Lord do to the spiritually weak when the prayer of faith is prayed? The Lord will raise them up to be able to hold the trial for a little bit longer. The Lord will see that person through. I think we have to deal with a little bit here um, this phrase, the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick. And the Lord will raise him up and if he's committed sins he will be forgiven. Uh, I do not think this is a reference that every single time this will happen without fault. I don't think that's what James is saying. He doesn't give any duration to it. 
He simply says the prayer of faith will save the weak person. That is true. The prayer of faith will save the weak person. But it might not do it every single time. And it is always the Lord who will raise the weak person up. It's never the elders. They don't get the praise here. It's never the oil. They don't get the praise here. It's always the Lord who lifts up the weak person. But we have to understand that the Lord that lifts up the weak person is the sovereign Lord of all who can do as he pleases. And so sometimes he might choose to lift that person up and sometimes he might not. The prayer of faith that's offered to the Lord that trusts for the healing also understands that we are praying to the sovereign God who may or may not, who, who, who this person's healing is totally dependent on. The prayer of faith says, Lord, we, we desire this person to be healed. Let, let it be done if it's your will. Let it be done if it's your will. The prayer of faith will save the one who is sick. It will. The prayer of faith will save the one who is sick. But maybe not every single time. The Lord will raise him up. He will raise him up to be able to bear that trial. And if he has committed sins, here's another reason I think it's spiritual. If he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Sin obviously has with it great spiritual effects or defects. It, 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 it totally wrecks our spirituality. It totally wrecks our spiritual growth. It totally wrecks our ability to continually, to continually bear up underneath the trial. If he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, moving on, so we went through all of those, the tough part of the passage. Um, what did we, what did we end with? We got resurrection, raised up, we got sin, uh, forgiveness, here we go. Therefore, confess, confession is the next one, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another. So this is a kind of a transitional statement. James goes from talking to individuals and then to the elders and then to right here in verse 16, the entire church. So in the, in the community uh, of Christians, the Christian community, it's comprised of confession, confession to our fellows, fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. Confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. I think a lot of times we lean more on the right side of that. We pray for one another a lot. Sometimes we don't confess our sins to one another. Um, and of course, y'all are students. So you have to be really careful about this. It should only be, um, in my opinion, with um, older people that you trust very much of the same gender. So girls with your girl small group leaders, they are there so that you can confess sin to them. Um, our older ladies in the church that you might be especially close with, they are there so that you can confide in them and confess sin. Um, our pastors, your parents, they're there so that you can confess sin and have them pray for you. And I guarantee you, every single time, if the person is who they should be, you will find more grace in them than you could ever imagine. A lot of times we're too scared to confess sin because we're scared of the response. But I can tell you from personal experience, every single time I have experienced more grace, grace from the person that I'm confessing to than anything else in the world. Why? Because that person is a sinner and they understand your sin. I'm just, I'm telling you that is true. So trust that. Trust mature brothers and sisters in Christ. Trust your parents. Um, confide in them. Confess sin to them that they may pray for you that you may be healed. So you've got, um, you got confession involved here, prayer, and healing. Prayer keeps coming up. It's a vital part of the Christian community. Um, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. And I think this could refer to um, definitely spiritual healing, 
uh, you're confessing your sin. Uh, obviously, when sin's involved, you're going to need spiritual healing. Um, but this is pray for one another that you may be healed. I think that's a way more general statement than the previous scenario with the elders. Um, I think it could apply to a wide variety of different things. Physical, emotional, spiritual, uh, anything like that. Then James says the prayer of a righteous person. So we got prayer again. You see that continually popping up. How are you doing in the Christian community? Are you praying? That's a good evaluator for whether or not you are operating in a correct manner within the church. Are you praying and praying a lot? It's one of the most vital things we can do in Christian community. Prayer, healing, prayer, righteousness, and power. The prayer of a righteous person has great power in its working. You see that sin is a very big issue here. The prayer of a righteous person. We need to get sin out of our lives. We need to confess it and confess it quickly and weed it out of our lives that we might become more and more righteous. Now, of course, we are righteous in Christ, totally righteous positionally in Christ. When God looks at you in Christ, he sees Christ not your sin. But practically, we are going to have to continually be defeating and killing sin in our practical lives. That's why James is telling us to confess it. That's why James is saying the prayer of a righteous person. You are righteous in Christ. But also, we need practical righteousness. And when you have that practical and positional righteous, the prayer of that righteous person has great power as it's working. It has great, great power. He says, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. In other words, he was just like you. He was a sinful human being. He struggled with sin. He had areas where he did not fully trust God. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain for three years and six months and did not give rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. I think sometimes we think, that because we are so sinful, maybe our prayers don't work. Elijah would, would speak differently, so would James. Elijah was a man like us. He was a sinful human man. He was from a place that no one knows where it is. So if, if you are an ordinary person that is sinful, and maybe you feel like nobody knows who you are, and you're from obscurity, your prayers can have great power. Those are the requirements. And so, let's get to praying, because we all qualify. Let's get to confessing our sins and praying, and guess what? God will do His work. Now, Elijah, when he was praying, he was praying based on a promise that God had given for a drought. Right? So he's praying in line with God's Word. And God used Elijah's prayers to accomplish the drought that he already promised. God used Elijah's prayers to accomplish the drought he already promised. God wants to involve us in the process of accomplishing his purposes in the world. But will we join him? Will we pray? He was a man with a nature like ours. He prayed fervently. So in this example, we have... So we have righteousness, power, examples. Look at Elijah. He's our example. Fervency. Is your prayer life fervent? Do you pray according to this and God's promises contained here as if those promises are actually true? Is that how we pray? Remember, Elijah is praying in congruence with, with what God had already said. And so with his fervency, he is trusting God. He is fervently passionate about the truth of God's word. And he is praying that God would bring his word to pass. And of course, God does. So our faith is fueled and our prayers are answered. Provision. I'll go ahead and read all the rest of them out because we'll, we'll get through this pretty quickly. Examples, fervency, provision, family, wondering, truth, confrontation, restoration, 
encouragement, sin, salvation, love, grace, mercy, and forgiveness. When Elijah prayed, he was a man with a nature like ours. He prayed fervently that it might not rain. For three years and six months it didn't rain. Provision. God acting in accordance with his word. Then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. I think the reason James brings up this illustration is to say, for the spiritually weak that he was talking about. For the spiritually weak, you might feel parched right now. You might feel like there's no rain on your ground to produce fruit, to produce spiritual strength. But pray, confess sins, call the elders, let them pray over him, and you will be restored. The fruit will come. Then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. We can think of it um, in, 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 in congruence with chapter 5, verse 7. Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. Be patient in the spiritually weak time. Be patient in the spiritually defeated time until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits patience for the precious fruit of the earth. Same thing happening with Elijah. Being patient about it until it received the early and late rains. Be patient in the spiritually weak times. Establish your hearts, verse 8, until the coming of the Lord. As an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets. Elijah, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast, who were patient for the fruit of the earth to sprout up in their life. You have heard the steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purposes of the Lord. Key phrase, this is verse 11, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. Remember in your spiritually weak time that the Lord is compassionate and merciful. Remember in your time of spiritual drought that the Lord is compassionate and merciful and that we must be patient for renewal. And to be patient to be raised back up to be able to bear the weakness and trials that we're going through. James says in verse 19, My brothers, if anyone wonders from the, from, wonders from the truth, and I just want to comment and say it is usually a wondering it is usually a slow fade into error. And one of the slowest fades that I can perceive right now in our culture is the fact that we do not think truth, absolute truth, exists. James says, my brothers, if anyone among you wonders from the truth, there is truth and there is error. There is right and there is wrong. Once we start doubting that, we are wondering from the truth. That is one of the most important things I could ever teach you. Truth exists, and you can wonder from it. So we must be very, very careful. If anyone among you wonders from the truth, wondering happens through listening to weird, bad uh, sermons, speakers, worship songs, um, sin, reading bad books filled with erroneous theologies, listening to the wrong people, taking part in the wrong things, entertaining with things that we shouldn't be entertaining with. It is a wondering. It is a slow fade away from the truth. If anyone among you wonders from the truth and somebody brings him back, let him know. It's assurance here. I think it goes both ways. He says, let him know that whoever brings him back a sinner from his wondering. So James says that wondering from the truth is sinning. Whoever brings back a sinner from his wondering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. So the person wondering, wondering is sinning, and you might be wondering because you are sinning. Wondering is sinning, and you might be wondering because you are sinning. So evaluate yourself. 
If anyone wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. I think there's two forms of assurance here. One is that the person who brings him back, the person who brings back the person from wandering, needs to be assured that he did the right thing and that he saved his brother from death and sin. Most of the time, when people go to get a brother, it's really hard, and they often wonder whether or not they're doing the right things and if they're doing it in the right ways. Yes, they are. Sometimes we judge the person that goes to get the person that's wondering. We judge that person on whether or not we think he's doing it the right way or not. But in reality, he's probably the only one that actually has the heart to go get that person. So maybe we should stop judging that person, and maybe we should just start being thankful for that person and letting him know that he's saving that person from death and sin. Number two, the second person that needs to be assured. First guy needs to be assured that he's doing the right thing. The second guy needs to be assured that he's doing the wrong thing. And it's the sinner that's wondering. He needs to, we need to let him know, we need to warn him that when he was wondering, he was sinning, and he was on the way to uh, death and a multitude of sins. And now that somebody brought him back, he has been saved from that. So we rejoice with him. But we also warn him of where he really was in his life. Let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sin. So in this part we see confrontation, restoration, encouragement, sin. It's always present in the Christian community. Always. Until we get to heaven. Salvation, love, grace, mercy, and forgiveness because this person is restored back to the body of Christ. We go get the one while still uh, caring and loving for the 99. We go get the straying sheep just as Jesus does with us. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this text. Thank you for your word. Help us to be people of prayer, righteous people people that trust your word and pray in accordance with your word. Help us to go get the wayward brother and guard us from being wayward ourselves. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. James is over and Sean is out.